right, so we'll welcome, welcome everyone to the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council. This evening's Wednesday workshop is Legal Basics presented by Jessica Kerr. Jessica is out of the city. She has an art background as well as a law degree. Um, she's got all kinds of good stuff here. Jessica, do you want to kind of um, share a little bit about yourself? and let us know like when we're allowed to ask questions and all that good stuff and you, yeah. can, you can take it away great i'm happy to be here and um i'll tell you just recording a in progress um i my background's in art history and art museum studies and prior to my career as an attorney i worked as a collections manager and so um kind of bringing that into my legal career i specialize in um general corporate work so transactional i do contracts and helping businesses with every stage but also individuals so artists if you're a business by yourself um, and i also specialize in nonprofits coming from the art world and that background and it looks like where you have someone looking at a 501 uh, c3 question so that's great um, and i'll say generally with questions i can't see everybody so i think the chat will be easiest and you're welcome to ask questions throughout i'll try to um save as many as possible for the end, but please interrupt me um, if anything comes up that's kind of relevant as we're going through. Um, I'm happy to make this more of a conversation as well. Um, so, um, Ed, I will definitely get to your question about fiscal agent responsibilities. Um, I'm just going to start, kind of give you a little bit of a, a overview of what we're looking at today. So first, I'm just going to kind of go into entities you could be. So as a sole proprietor or forming an LLC, and then some things to consider when you're creating contracts or entering into contracts, and then intellectual property. So copyright, trademarks, um, patents, and then we'll leave some time for questions. But as I said, please feel free to interrupt me with questions in the chat as well, or Type up. I just can't see hands raised. Um, so just to start, um, I there's some a lot of business structures you can be. You can be a sole proprietor, so that's just working on your own. You can be a partnership entering into typically a partnership agreement with another person or another business. Um, an LLC is kind of forming an entity with the state and having a business name, and that provides some protection. A uh, corporation and then a nonprofit corporation, which is a process you would go through with the IRS to apply for your corporation to be tax exempt. And that would have a charitable purpose. Often arts organizations are um, nonprofit organizations because they do educational purposes and community outreach, things like that. So the two I'm mainly going to focus on are sole proprietorship and LLC just because those are the easiest and typically when you're first starting out, those are the best, unless you are forming a 501c3, which is just a more extensive process. Um, so with those two, I want to highlight some of the biggest differences. So the one, two I really want to focus on are taxes and personal liability. So is a sole proprietor. So if you're just working on your own, I want to emphasize that anything, any liability, so anytime someone wants to sue you over something, um, that would all be on you. The nice part about forming an LLC, even if it's just yourself, is that that liability is with the entity, so it doesn't come for you personally. So what that means is, let's say you are working on your own as an artist and you have your own bank account, you're a sole proprietor, and someone tries to sue you and they win, then they can come after your personal house, car, all of those assets. But if you're formed as an LLC and you have a separate bank account for that LLC, if someone sues you and they win, they would have to only get whatever money you have as part of that business. So that bank account, or if you had some equipment that was part of that business, where um, so they couldn't come after your personal home, your car, anything like that. So that's one of the big advantages. What sometimes, has people not want to do an LLC is just the cost you do have to pay to form an LLC with the state. It is not a large cost, but it can be prohibitive sometimes. So some things we like to say with if you are a sole proprietor to kind of protect yourself is just as much as you can keep your business separate, have a separate bank account, 
have separate, keep track of your taxes as much as possible, anything that's a business expense. Um, because when you are a sole proprietor, you're also taxed all at individual tax rates. Um, I'm not an accountant, so I don't know all the nitty gritty of your taxes, but I will say that as a sole proprietor, the key things we always say are to keep every receipt, track your donation. So if you're donating art to anything that can be a deduction for you, um, those are similar recommendations with an LLC, but instead of being taxed at necessarily at your individual level, you can also choose to be taxed at the business. So it just makes a slightly different um, way of being taxed and sometimes a bit easier because you are creating that separation. Um, generally, e for either a sole proprietorship or an LLC, you're going to want to use independent contractor agreements. So those are called 1099s. And that's something if you're ever working with someone, you would have them fill out a 1099. And that just means that all of that tax responsibility. So if you paid someone, let's say, to help you hang an artwork, um, you would want them to fill that out so they know that any money they earned from you, if you paid them $50, any taxes they owed the government is on them. So that's just a really important form we like to emphasize to keep in mind that if someone's working with you, you're not an employer, you want them to know that the, any tax responsibility for money you give them is on them. Um, uh, and then there's a corporation, which I haven't gone much into, but the formation documents for a corporation are a bit more complicated um, than an LLC, and it's a bit more money, but you also have a different tax structure. You're taxed at the entity level and at the individual level. Typically, corporations is not a recommended structure if it's just yourself or yourself and another person, unless you're trying to raise money or you're trying to be a nonprofit. Those are the two reasons you would want to be a corporation, really, if you want investors or you are hoping to become a 501c3. Um, so I guess this is actually a good um, turn. I can talk to Ed's question a little bit. Um, uh, so a 501c3, something you can do is um, be, a, if you are already a 501c3, you have that status with the IRS, you can be a fiscal agent for another group that doesn't want to go through the whole process of becoming a nonprofit or a nonprofit because it is a long application with the IRS. Sometimes it can take up months. Um, so a fiscal agent can be a benefit for if you are a 501c3, it can be a way to earn some money um, to be a fiscal agent for someone else. The things that we really think about when being a fiscal agent is you want to make sure it, because being a fiscal agent can challenge your exempt status. So it can, if you're if the person you're being a fiscal agent for does anything that isn't allowed as a nonprofit. So for example, nonprofits can't lobby for political figures. If they did anything like that, it could also be kind of be a risk to your status, exempt status. So typically a fiscal agent will enter into a kind of an agreement with that other entity and just say, we get to see your quarterly reports. We get to kind of overlook a little bit of everything just to keep a little bit of control. That's one thing we recommend if you're going to be a fiscal agent. And I will say there's some good, I think it was the Science Museum of Minnesota maybe did a really good, um, uh, there's like some online stuff that helps talk about what you want to think about with that. And I can send it to Holly maybe, and she can um, pass it on after this as well, because there are some good online resources for that. Um, did that help answer your question though? Yes. What I wanted to know is uh, if, if, uh, um, if we are a fiscal agent for someone else, what are the bounds of what they are allowed to do? My understanding was that if we um, we have a mission statement and a, and a charter that allowed us to have a 501c, so if we're a fiscal agent for someone else, uh, do they have to comply completely within our mission statement? I mean, does it have to? Does anything that they do have to fit within our 501c? Piece? 
the thing that gave us a 501c statement. And more specifically, ours says our, we will do something within the county, a, a certain geographical area. If they do something outside of that geographic area, it doesn't, it isn't inside our mission statement and how we got our 501c status. Our, uh, do, are we allowed to reimburse them for things they did outside of our charter? Yeah, I haven't seen issues with geographic restrictions for 501c3. I think the only issue you would run into is if they were doing something um, that was different than a 501c3. So there's other 501c statuses like a 501c5 and things like that, which are more towards um, religious organizations. There's some with political groups. So if they were doing something really different that doesn't fall under the same IRS category, if that makes sense. I think that's where you would run into issues. Um, but I can also follow up. I might have a little bit more information on that I can provide afterwards as well. Thank you. Yes. Um, this is just another kind of note for if you are working for yourself and don't want to form an LLC, sometimes it can be really helpful to file what's called a doing business as name. So um, that just has means it's not the same as um, it's you're just doing business as a name instead of your own personal name. It doesn't change the liability at all. Unfortunately, it's still on you if you don't form an LLC, but it is just a way to um, make things look a little more formal and can be helpful for some of the contracts and things like that. Um, do, do, do. Sorry, I'm just looking at a question. Um, I will look at that in one moment. I'm just gonna finish this thought. Um, this is something I kind of touched on a little bit earlier, but with an LLC, you'll wanna make sure you keep a separate bank account. And if you do wanna hire any employees who aren't just independent contractors, you will wanna apply for what's called an employer identification number. And that thankfully is a fairly simple process. It's one IRS form you fill out. Um, it's called an SS4, um, doesn't need too much information and you usually get it back very quickly. Um, another word on LLCs, you need a couple of basic documents called an articles of formation and an operating agreement, but they're fairly simple. And I shouldn't say this as an attorney because this is what I do for a living, but you can find online forms that are pretty good and basic unless you are forming a very complicated organization. Usually some basic online forms are actually going to be okay for your business. Um, if you are forming something more complicated, you may want to talk to an attorney just to see what you need. Um, there is, as I discussed, there's an initial filing fee but there's no recurring fees for you to renew annually. Um, the Secretary of State actually of Minnesota has a pretty good website that answers a lot of questions on how to kind of go about formation. Um, so that's if you need anything on that. Um, let me look at this question really quickly. Um, Um, so I think someone was asking about, um, you know, if they, if they're covered liability wise, um, uh, so if you don't have a lot of personal assets that you're worried about, it may be another reason to just stay a sole proprietor, um, you may want to consider getting some kind of insurance policy. Some of them are pretty low. Um, it really is, I, we talk about it a lot with our clients, it really is how risk adverse you are. Um, if you're doing a lot of things where you're more worried, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, if you're doing a lot of heavy sculptures or something where you can be more worried that maybe they'll be in public or you're doing um, group art where you're, doing performances around people where you're a little bit more worried about interactions and things like that. Sometimes that can come into consideration, but I'll say, I think a lot of artists work as sole proprietors happily for many years. The LLC is just kind of another level of protection for yourself. Um, 
And uh, there was a second question about an umbrella policy is a great idea if you are a sole proprietor. Um, an S Corp is an option as an LLC. So as an LLC, I didn't go into this detail. You can choose how you're taxed. So it's either at the individual level, so like a sole proprietor, and that would be taxed as an S Corp. Um, and then, or you can be taxed as a corporation, so a C Corp, which is double taxation, um, which you typically would not do, but um, it is an option for both. Um, so now just talking a little bit about general contracts, this is legally when you need, when you need to have a contract, there's a couple of important instances, I will say probably um, sales of your artwork are going to be pretty big. It would be, it's always great if you can get a bill of sale for any sales, especially if your artwork is over $500. Um, you don't need a long contract, but just something that says, you know, I artist sold this to you on this date and a signature, couple signatures. It's just a good record to have. Um, I will say, especially I've seen a lot of artists have a hard time if they don't enter into contracts with galleries. Um, I know that can be hard because galleries may not want to, but sometimes it's important to spell out what the expectations are from each party, whether let's say they don't sell your work, will they, bring, will they pay to send it back to you if it's not local? Will, um, I'm trying to think of another good instance, the percentage you'll earn on sales if you're not getting all of that money, things like that can be really helpful to have a contract. Um, these are just some general things to consider to include in a contract, how big the scope is, um, the payment, when you'll be getting it in addition to how much. So will you get the payment up front? Will it be a percentage over time? Will it be after something sells? Um, something a lot of people don't think about is canceling or amending a contract. So let's say that relationship goes sour. You may want to think about what do I want to build into this contract to say, okay, if neither of us, you know, if something goes wrong, you can notify the other person and say 30 days, this contract is canceled. Um, it's just something to think about depending on what type of situation and contracts are really flexible. Uh, really, all you need to have a legally binding contract is an offer, acceptance, and what's called consideration. And that just means that both sides have something, some skin in the game. So one person is doing work, one person is paying for it, is a good example of that. And contracts can be valid even if they're oral, but it's much harder to prove, obviously, if something goes wrong. So we really recommend written contracts. but. I always say not to be scared that they have to be in really fancy legal writing. For a basic contract, you can really write, I offer you this, you accept it for this, and we both agree for that this is why we're doing this. So for money, for time, for work. Um, these are just a couple things to think about if anyone does public art. Um, a lot of times there can be issues with liability for the installation. I think I talked about like a sculpture falling over, but often if something goes wrong during that, who's going to be responsible? Um, a big one that I'll touch on a little more is removal or relocation. So if you put a mural up in a public place, if you don't want that ever painted over, you know, that's something you would really need to talk about at the outset. Um, maintenance of it, they might ask you to come touch up that mural, a site preparation, all of these things are just, they might not be relevant for every time, but something to think about if you're ever, if someone hands you a contract or if you're trying to write a contract. Um, I think I said earlier, there are some really good samples of contracts online um, and a lot of organizations like Springboard for the Arts who I'm working with tonight do have samples as well. Um, so now I'm turning to intellectual property. So there are different types of intellectual property and I'm not going to be covering them all tonight because it would take unfortunately too long, but just starting with copyright. Um, here's just some key things to think about. For it to be a copyright or something copy copyrightable, it has to be a fixed in a tangible form. And that means it can't just be a thought is not copyrightable. Um, and it's 
has to be original. So it can't just be something that, you know, you took a photocopy from a book and said, you know, now this is mine. There's something called fair use that I will touch on in a little bit, which is a way to use a public image in a different way. Um, but it's not, it's a defense. If someone argued with you that it wasn't copyrightable, it's not a good way to have a copyright, if that help makes sense. Um, copyrights last for 70 years after death, so they're not forever. Um, and they are um, divisible. Um, oh, I'm not familiar with the Richard Prince case. <laughs> so a lot of artists have um, gotten away with taking images of other um, works or other images and being able to say that um, they transformed it enough for it to be a copyright. Um, so this is just kind of a good general idea of what isn't copyrightable. So ideas, titles, it has, it's not tangible, um, procedures, processes, common property. So a calendar, a phone number isn't copyrightable, anything like that. Um, this one's important to think about. There's a lot of copyright rights that we don't think about. Um, um, I'll have to look that up, talking about a court case with uh, Richard Prince. Um, so when you're thinking about your copyright, there's not only your copyright of who can publish an image of this, but sometimes there's also rights you can give someone one-off rights, you can give them forever rights. And typically the nice thing with copyright is that you keep your copyright even though you sell someone your artwork. That is the general method of doing it. You can sell someone the copyright if you would like to, um, but generally you are keeping your copyright when you sell an artwork. Um, and this is important to remember too, if someone tries to um, publish a book, wants to publish a book with your artworks or you wanna publish them, but often the, purchase, the person who will purchase your work will want you to give them a right to do things with the image. So let's say um, the, the best example I have right now is a museum. If you donate your artwork to a museum, typically they'll ask you, great, you have the copyright, but can we please have rights to publish images of it in a catalog, in advertising, everything like that. So you'll often see license agreements is typically how that is done. Um, so just thinking about there's a lot of different rights that go into a copyright, even though it just seems like one intellectual property. Um, this is kind of just showing what I was just talking about. There's different ways to look at it. Um, there are different forms to fill out depending on what type of copyright it is, the different medium. Um, I am not a copyright attorney. so. These forms are not what I do on a daily basis, but I know a lot of people fill out their copyright forms and the forms do have long instructions. Now I won't say they're the easiest to read, but they have instructions that you can follow as you're filling it out, um, kind of side by side. So I do recommend that. And I also recommend that with IRS forms, they have instructions that go side by side. I didn't say that earlier, but anytime you're doing that, the instructions can be really helpful because often they come from questions they got over and over again on how to fill these forms out. Um, this is, these are a couple common questions I think that Springboard has come across. Um, do you need to place a C in a circle? You don't have to, but it never hurts anything. Um, do you still have a copyright even if you didn't register it? Yes but it's a really good idea to register it because it gives you a lot more power to fight against someone who's trying to take your copyright. Um, you don't have to prove that you had it first, which sometimes can be hard to show. Um, it costs $35 online to register it. Um, and I just said this, it just might make it harder to defend um, your intellectual property if you don't register it, but you do not have to. You have a copyright no matter what. Um, Let's see. Um, so this is, I think I mentioned this earlier, the owner has the physical right to your artwork if you sell it, but you retain an underlying copyright. And this destroy part, I'm gonna touch on um, a separate right in a little bit. 
called moral rights, which can help you in that instance. Um, these are just kind of some common symbols you'll see. These are easy to find online if you want to know what any of these mean um, when you're kind of putting copyright symbols on something. Um, these are just an ideas of public domain. So after that 70 years is up, what goes into the public domain. Some artists, I will say, will, I think, um, Picasso is a really good example. The copyright uh, made sure to pass to the estate. So even though some of the works are older than that, they still own the copyright um, to those. Um, so this is something to think about with series and collections. Many artists will take a multiple works into one copyright or want to add in a work to an existing copyright, and those can get a little bit more complicated. So you'll just want to think about when you're doing a series, if it is an orderly series that can go into one copyright or if it's something that needs to be multiple. Um, I think this is a good note. Errors can be corrected, so it's okay if the forms aren't filled out perfectly the first time. It, won't ruin your registration. You can always correct things. Um, this is just a couple how-tos on registering. You, It's always faster and cheaper online. If you have questions, there's tutorials, there's instructions, as I mentioned. You can always call the office. Um, and everything's effective on the date you submit them. So you can, even if you don't get the evidence back, everything's going to be valid that date, which can be helpful if someone's trying to take your copyright. Um, and these are kind of just a few slides showing you what that website looks like. So then a patent is really applicable more to design. It's typically tools or machines are what patents are used for, because it's really about the ideas of how something works but often there can be machines or tools and art as well. So they can be important. I will say copyrights are fairly easy to get registered and are fairly cheap, $35 online. The patents and trademarks are a tad more complicated. Typically you do need a specialized attorney who can help, help you fill out a patent or trademark application. I believe you can do it online, but this is not my specialty. So I wouldn't want to advise on how exactly to fill out these applications. I know attorneys who, this is all they do, is spend their days filing patent applications. So they can get very complicated because you have to have, everything has to be original and different. Um, and they really look at that, um, the design, the utility. Um, so this is about the watch design of a watch. So it looks like Andy Warhol filed this one in 1991. Um, utility, so the way a sculpture works. Um, and then a trademark is really going to be more about, so it's going to be Hershey's, Disney, things that are brands, logos, um, artist names can be a trademark, a signature. You'll see all these designs if you have a special kind of symbol as your design, colors, Play-Doh, NBC. Um, like I said, brand names, merchandise, your signature could be really important. So these are, as I said, typically more expensive and more difficult. And so it's something where you'll want to think about it. If you may want to hire an attorney to help you with these, there are many attorneys throughout the state who work on this specifically. Um, but you, I think copyrights are really helpful, especially in the artistic sphere. And it's a lot easier than patents and trademarks. Um, so this was, I, I mentioned this earl, earlier, moral rights, but moral rights can be really helpful for artists because they are underlying rights that you don't give up even if your art is not in your hands. And they can be really important for if someone tries to destroy a work of yours or tries to take ownership for it and it isn't theirs, you have underlying rights under what's called the Visual Artist Rights Act or VARA. It was passed by the federal government, and a lot of states have protection, that kind of state protection that mirrors that act federally. And what it really does is, let's say you put a sculpture in a courtyard, 
and the owner who purchased your sculpture says, well, I think this is ugly. I don't want it anymore. I'm going to smash it into 10,000 pieces. You can say, no, I have rights under VARA um, and I have 90 days to come pick that up before you destroy it, which can be really helpful often with it's, this has really come into play a lot with public art. So murals, sculptures outside, things like that, where there's a threat of destruction or um, mutilation, anything like that. So this is just kind of going into the actual act. Um, this was, there's, these are just a couple of examples that are included of where it's come into play. This five points was a really big case in the last couple years where there was a kind of some empty buildings that a developer owned and he said, he hired a curator and said, okay, bring in the best, you know, street artist, the best muralist, you know, and let's create kind of an artist space here. And then one day the developer said, nope, I'm ready to build apartments. This is in New York. I'm very much simplifying this, but he, the next day whitewashed everything, um, just put paint over it all. And the artist brought a court case and they won a lot, a lot of money. Um, and it was really big for those artists. The thing I will say that is a little bit harder is there's this phrase under there where you have to argue that your artwork is of recognized stature. However, often in the cases I've seen, you are typically using this more before anything happens. They're saying, I'm going to get rid of your work. And you say, no, you can't do that. You have to give me time. You have to give me 90 days to try to collect it before you destroy it or do something. I think I worked with an artist recently who he had a gallery who said, yeah, we're done with your sculptures. We're going to destroy them. And he said, no, nope. <laughs> hold on. You have to give me the time to come and collect these. And that's something I kind of just going back to contracts. He didn't have a contract with this gallery and they said, well, they belong to us now. And he said, no, they're with me. So that's just something where a contract can be really helpful at the very beginning, just spelling out, you might be holding on to my artwork, but it's still mine or anything like that. What happens when our relationship ends? Um, this is right to publicity. So any, if you have kind of a, a well-known name or anything like that. This is another intellectual property, right? Um, kind of just uh, another one to think about if you ever need it. This one's important, uh, right to privacy. Often it's not for yourself, but in your work. So you don't get in trouble. You wanna make sure that anyone you are photographing, videoing, anything like that, ideally you would like to have releases. There are laws where you can film, take pictures in public spaces. I say with this, um, just kind of think about the situation you're in. If it's one individual and you're able to get a release from them, you're really working with them, photographing them, that's the best case scenario. If it's in a public space, it's large groups, you're probably okay. Um, there's a note on here, always be careful with minors. That's just I think a general good piece of advice, whatever you're doing with kids, it's just going to be harder. There's going to be a lot more um, fight from people if you publish images of children without the permission of parents. Um, they typically will fight a little harder than if it's pictures of themselves. Um, this is something that kind of can go in the intellectual property, but also in contracting, something to think about when you are doing a work for hire that is not your intellectual property anymore. Often these agreements are, you are giving all of your intellectual property rights to the person you're doing the work for. However, that doesn't have to be the case. So often it's within the scope of employment. So you, I think this is a good example of being a graphic designer. You know, those logos, anything you're creating as a graphic designer are the company's, not your intellectual property. And often in work for higher contracts, it will also say this commission is our intellectual property, not yours. However, sometimes in a work for hire situation that can be negotiated. So, so that's just something to think about if you are ever being hired for something like that and you look at the contract, always make sure you look at that intellectual property language 
and see what it says. Does it say we have all rights to all intellectual property? And do you want to say, hey, I want to keep my copy? You know, it's, I always say it just depends on the situation. If it's, and often the power you have, if Target's hiring you, you probably don't have as much power to push back as if it's maybe, you know, a local business, you can say, I'd like to keep my copyright to that. Um, this is just kind of an option showing that the Springboard for the Arts has a lot of really good toolkits online that help with all of these things and business skills. Um, this, I think I mentioned briefly earlier, is a defense. So in fair use, it's the idea is, did you transform it, add something new? Um, it's These are just some of the things the court looks at, the, quanti the quantity and quality of the copyrighted material. Did you affect the market value? Is it used for non-commercial purposes? And this is the example of the Obama image. Um, they did not, this was considered fair use. Um, and like I said, it's a defense, not a right. So it's not something, you don't have a right to fair use, but you can use the fair use defense if someone argues that you have taken their intellectual property by using an image or anything like that. Um, just kind of another example of where fair use was upheld of using this image um, because it was different enough and it didn't diminish the original ad. Um, this is another example. However, in this case, it was not fair use because it looked almost identical. It was just an image of the sculpture. Um, sorry, I just saw, James, is your question about, just to clarify, is it about um, using photograph, so using a photograph of something to, pro of someone else's artwork to produce 2D art? No, just a photo, you, you should be fine. Um, it often comes up more in these situations where you're taking images of someone else's artwork. So in this case, it was a sculpture, uh, here it was a advertisement, and here it was a photograph someone had taken. So um, you typically don't have to worry about this too much unless you are literally taking images of someone else's intellectual property and just uh, changing it slightly. So, you know, think Warhol, and all of the art he did is typically where you can kind of think about fair use. Um, um, and that's it for my formal presentation. So I left about 20 minutes for questions if anyone has any. Just remember to hover over the top of your screen to unmute if you wanna speak. I have a, a question regarding um, um, a second, let me look through my note. I was getting ready for you to quit so fast. Um, let me get it together and, and I'll get back on you. Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, I could ask a question because I'm sure, you know, it's things that we get about musicians. Mm -hmm. So how, how can they protect their music? Yeah, so let me go back to, sorry, I know this is, I'm hoping not to make anyone motion sick. <laughs> um, let me go back to, so sound recordings. So that's form SR for copyright. Um, so you can re re register sound recordings. I will say with music um, or anything like that, it gets a little bit more complicated because it is, it is there's copyright of the composition. So the actual music, um, so that's going to be under form PA, but there's also copyright of a specific recording of it. So that could be a CD they put out, but it also could be something on a radio show anything like there's the actual individual recordings have their own copyright. So I know there's been a lot of case law around live recordings 
kind of, there's, I'm trying to remember the exact case. There was a musician who a radio program replayed a recording they took at one of his live shows. And he said, that's my copyrighted song. And they said that specific show was not copywritten. And I think he ended up winning in the end, but it's just something to think about is that you want to copyright both the composition as well as when you do record it. Um, it's just a good way to protect yourself. Thank you. Yeah. I think I got mine figured out. Sure. Um, so a situation where you would have a mm -hmm. some artwork, mm -hmm. let, let's say a kind of a logo-esque kind of artwork with a um, statement or a tagline, if you will, that goes with it. And those things get bundled up to um, maybe to make, you know, cards or buttons or coffee mugs, whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you want to get a trademark for those. Is that right? As opposed to a copyright? Um, you can do both. So you could say that it's a design, so you could get a copyright for that. But a trademark is going to be a bit more powerful because what a trademark does is it says that you can't have anything else that's even similar that would be confusing. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, there was, I think, a company that lost against Apple because they wanted to sell, they wanted to name something Apple, but they were not even selling technology. They were selling, I think, something related to actual apples, edible apples. And they lost because it was too similar. Um, it's trademarks just, te I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. So if your design is something where you have your logo and your your tagline and you just don't want anyone to take that exact combination so of that logo and the tagline a copyright is going to protect you if you're worried that 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 also represents kind of your brand and you don't want anyone to even kind of be near it and i think that's when it when it really is representing your brand is when a trademark might be more important because you want to make sure that is representing yours um, so I'd say start with the copyright since it's easier, quicker, and cheaper, and then you can also trademark it, um, kind of to double protect you. It just trademarks take a little bit longer to file and are more expensive, mm -hmm. um, right. but it is, if it's for your brand, it can be important to trademark it just so that is your brand and no one can confuse it with another mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that helps. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> Yes, and I will. Um, I'm going to just send those to um, to Holly afterwards because I need to make sure I find the right ones. So, Ed, if you'll just um, email me like in the next couple days or even next week, and so that I have your email and I can get those links to you. Um, Jean, okay. no, if oh, sorry. Um, Jean, for your question, no. Um, if your employees are, if your musicians are W-9 employees, then um, you just have a W-9 for them. So it's, and you're either a W-9 employee or a 1099 independent contractor, so it won't be both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, where's your, where do I find your email? Is that going to be on the website? Yes, it's grants at arracouncil.org. But if you go on to our website, it's under the, like, about us or who we are. Okay. You'll see it right there. And if you have any trouble, you could also request it through our Facebook. Okay, thanks. Sure.
and then we are recording this too so that and we will post it under our workshop tabs on our resources um, page and so you can refer back to it at any time that you would like um, and, and uh, just to make sure that we're all on the up and up too is this is from Springboard for the Arts. If you are not familiar with Springboard for the Arts, make yourself familiar. It's right, you can see the tagline there at the bottom uh, with their address. They have the most robust resources um, of anything I've seen out there. They um, exist to be an, uh, like an economic uh, driver and teacher for artists to how to line yourself up as um, an entrepreneur because if you are making your living as an artist you are an art entrepreneur so and they're just wonderful to work with they're based out of Minnesota but they're nationwide and they're very highly regarded oh it looks chipped do you have another thing for us you'll need to unmute if you do. Um, so, oh, would, would Springboard be a, a, a good resource um, to find legal help in um, establishing a trademark? Yeah, so um, Springboard has volunteer attorneys just like myself who they, you can put a request that you need to help for a specific uh, purpose and then Springboard can connect you with an attorney. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Additionally, if, if you need help with any of your structuring or you just don't, if you, if you need help with anything, they will, um, you just can call and make an arrangement with them and they'll give you an hour of advice. They do it on a sliding scale um you know so it's it's inexpensive and they're quite wonderful and like i said you can go into their website and you'll see like thrive as an individual or thrive as an organization mm -hmm. and you know for a lot of people both of those things apply but definitely do the deep you kind of kind of drill down but their resources are great because they really break out in a lot of detail, different grant options, different resources. It's really impressive. And they are the ones that directed me to Jessica. So I really enjoy working with them. It's great. Yeah, they're lovely on many, many levels. Um, I'm trying to think of any other. OK, so then if you are a writer, that's a copyright, correct? If you write a book, copyright is the way you want to go. Yep. Um, if you are a painter, you copy copyright the images, correct? Yep. Okay. I'm just trying to think of the different legal. Um, and then how about, because it's a new area now too, like the digital animation the virtual or here's here I'll really throw a monkey wrench how about an nft <laughs> yeah that you're in you're into complicated territory now there's a, there. yeah, no, you're, you're in you're in the law is being created right now for those okay. things. Um, no i think those are really good questions cuz i think the law is not caught up with the technology right we don't i think a lot of artists are trying to find ways and i know like one of the attorneys at my firm is doing um, a workshop right now on something with video games and copywriting the movement, I think in those. Um, so I don't have all the answers on that, unfortunately. I will say that I think there's probably some better resources online than I could even give you because that's changing really quickly. Videos can certainly be um, copywritten, but I think that some of that stuff falls into patents as well, because you're talking about technology and the way that technology works and the coding and all of that. So I don't want to speak beyond my depth, <laughs> but I will say a lot of that is really new law. And so there's a lot of specialists who are writing about that, a lot of really good resources out there that are probably even better than 
I could help someone with that. So um, hopefully that information is going to catch up with the art. But yeah, the NFTs is a really interesting one for intellectual property because it's actually that code rather than the image itself, mm -hmm. I guess, that's becoming the the ownership because that's what makes it yours and not because anyone can look at it, but it's the co it's fascinating. I there's a this is very nerdy of me, but there's a legal art uh, legal arts podcast out there that does some really good episodes, and they had one about this topic. So oh, if anyone nice. is really interested in the intersection of art and law, um, <laughs> there's good podcasts out there. <laughs> you know what? And send me the link to that too. I will. I will. I will. It yeah. is. Put it on our yeah. resource page because I, I'm kind of trolling that too for a while. We're like, what are you listening to? Because there are some really good. There are. Uh, but I think that that might be very helpful for some of our folks. Um, here's an odd question to kind of reverse engineer things. Um, so I know that I have a musician that um, wants to uh, take um, and, and like reverse engineer and write down guitar riffs from a very famous person, but there's no like tablature for it. And he's having a hard time figuring out how does he traverse the copyright of that music in mm -hmm. order to be able to share it with his students. Oh, interesting. Um, um, yeah, that's a good question. Because I think for I, I believe there's exceptions if it's for educational purposes. I believe you can use there's exceptions for that. Um, I know there are exceptions for educational purposes. I just am trying to remember. There's also limits. It's, I think, limited to certain amounts of, like, I know, for example, teachers can take books and use them for classes, but they can only use so much without paying for it and things like that. So I don't remember off the top of my head what amount they could use for educational purposes, if, that is, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good question but and so, but just where they start would they go to that person's estate would they go um, to an agency of sorts would they yeah there's so a lot of musical copyrights are held by big agencies that's often mm -hmm. how music is is stored but some other musicians do their own copyrights so and for, that's probably a little bit of research online just to see if they can find out where that musician has their copyrights it should be public information because a lot of musicians want that information out there so their music can be used in movies commercials whatever it may be so um but yeah some there's some big copyright repositories for musicians so it might be one of those okay